bipartisanship and has uh, broken out. There's less gridlock. You did children's health. You did progress on Medicare. New attorney general passed today with bipartisan votes. You're about 100 days in. What are the factors, the dynamics that are causing there to be some, not just breaking a gridlock with Republicans, but bipartisan progress with talks on a lot of other topics as well? Well, I think uh, the fact that we have uh, a change in leadership in the Senate has certainly made a difference. And uh, while I get a good relationship uh, with the former majority leader, uh, the fact is not much came to the floor, and their members weren't engaged uh, on the floor uh, with each other, doing votes, doing amendments. Uh, and so the fact that the Senate is actually working uh, is helping us because uh, on the House side, we're able to move bills. Uh, but now what we're seeing is bills get to move in the Senate. Now, they don't move nearly as quickly, uh, but uh, uh, there's action. And, uh, and it's fostered an awful lot of bipartisan conversations on cybersecurity, on trade, uh, collecting of foreign intelligence, uh, elementary and secondary education reform. There's a whole host of things where there are bipartisan, bicameral conversations underway. And frankly, uh, the members feel good about it. For you then, as we think the rest of 2015, what are the biggest challenges you face as speaker, do you think? Well, I think that uh, dealing with the budget and the appropriation process is probably the biggest thing uh, that we're dealing with. I expect that we'll get a budget agreement uh, sometime soon uh, that uh, will come to the floor of the House and Senate. And the appropriation process is going to start earlier uh, than it's ever started. Uh, but uh, we're going to have some challenges because uh, we've got uh, bigger defense needs than we have the defense budget. And the president is threatening to veto these uh, uh, spending bills because uh, uh, we think we need to put more money in defense, and he'd rather spend more money uh, on non-defense items. So managing our way through that this year will be, will be a big challenge. I want to move to foreign policy. I want to cover a lot here. You took an overseas trip. You met with a lot of world leaders in the Middle East. What do you think right now President Obama is doing or not doing, if anything, that's making America less safe? Well, clearly, uh, the message I heard from uh, all of our allies, uh, from Israel to Saudi Arabia to Iraq uh, to Jordan uh, and others, is uh, they're wondering where America is. When's America going to lead? And, and while we're doing the work uh, uh, to fight ISIL, sitting down with Iranians, our allies are doing things as well. But the problems of ISIL and uh, Iran spreading terrorism throughout the region is growing faster uh, than what, what we and our allies are able to get our arms around. Uh, because what's missing here is an overarching strategy uh, that, uh, that we develop with our allies to deal with both of these problems. Uh, that overarching strategy does not exist today. Is it making us, is it a danger to the United States, the current policy, or simply not doing good enough? Uh, it is a danger to the United States because ISIS, as an example, uh, they're recruiting people from every country in the world. Uh, their social media uh, efforts at recruiting uh, are really pretty incredible. And uh, there's not nearly enough being done to deal with it. Okay. We asked a poll question recently of Americans about uh, foreign policy. We asked them, given all the conflict between President Obama, Prime Minister Netanyahu, we said, we asked people, are you more sympathetic to Prime Minister Netanyahu or President Obama? How would you answer that question? <laughs> Good effort. <laughs> Good try. Listen, uh, the president wants it, peace in the Middle East like we all do. It, I'll just say in our poll, when we asked that question to citizens, your fellow citizens, an overwhelming number of Republicans in the poll said they were more sympathetic to the positions of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Yeah. Listen, the president wants peace uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. And so do I. And for that matter, uh, so do the Israelis. But you can't force a peace agreement uh, on people who, who cannot come to an agreement. And as long as Hamas uh, is uh, in the powerful position they are with regard to the Palestinians, uh, this is a terrorist organization supported by Iran uh, who have made it clear that they think Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth. How do you sit down and develop a peace agreement with people with that attitude? And so I think the administration has overplayed their hand, overpressured uh, the Israelis. And uh, uh, the Prime Minister of, uh, of Israel, been a longtime friend of mine, uh, he came and gave, a, I thought, a fabulous address to the Congress about the real threats that America and the rest of the world face. All right, national pastime. We asked in the same poll, we asked people, which is a national pastime now, baseball or football? What say John Boehner? Oh, I'd say football. Football. I'd say football. 
Uh, but I've been a long time baseball fan. Grew up with the Cincinnati Reds, still a big Reds fan. So what makes football the national pastime? Uh, college football. I root for the Bengals. I, you know, I watch pro football. I watch the Super Bowl. But college football uh, is pretty exciting. And I, I see my share of it uh, in the fall. You seem to be enjoying the last this first hundred days plus here. You're getting stuff done, as you said, and you like to be here to get stuff done. You got a Democratic president now who I think it's fair to say you've been at least a little bit frustrated with at times. What will life be like for you in January of 2017 if you keep the majority, Mitch McConnell still the majority leader, and you have a Republican president? What will life be like for you, and how will things be different for Congress and the country? Well, it'll be a pretty exciting time to, uh, to take what I'll call a limited agenda uh, and to get it enacted. You know, you can't come uh, into a situation like that with 100 ideas and think they're all going to happen uh, overnight. And, uh, and if I were helping to guide this process, I'd focus it on, you know, no more than five things. Five things that uh, are important uh, for the American people uh, and to get accomplished. And focus in on them and figure out how you're going to get them done and then get them done. So get rid of the Affordable Care Act? Get rid of Obamacare. Fix the broken tax system. Uh, get the bureaucracy under control, the regulatory nightmare that, that's out there. That's three. Uh, you got two more to go, maybe uh, one on foreign policy. Uh, I would uh, strengthen our national defense and play a more active role around the world. And if you want my fifth to get America going again, I'd find a way to educate more of America's kids. We educate half of our kids. You know, more than half get a diploma. They get a diploma they can't read. When you look at the biggest driver of uh, what's higher education, the biggest cost driver is the fact that all the remedial education they have to do. We have to do, we as a society, have to do a better job of educating more of America's kids. Did you get everything off your chest you wanted to say? Sure. Sure. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Yeah.